In today's politically radicalized, hyper-online space, there seems to be an inability to understand the idea that humanity is capable of both good and evil, and all shades of in-between, often all at once and inside the same person. That sounds like a fancy quote, but that's just something I wrote. was recently released that made waves. It came out five days ago and already racked up more than 1.6 million views. Not only that, but it is more than an hour and a half long and raises questions about, well, as one commenter put it, everything. Nietzsche, how do you say it? I don't know. Tina Fey, Catgirl anime cosplay, Rasu, Spongebob, Freud, Marie Antoinette Trutherism, Jordan Peele, Huey Newton, a makeup demonstration, Dostoevsky's second most horrible protagonist, the blues as optimism, the Buddha, Paris Hilton, the incel black pill, the fraud of utopian ideology, sushi, Andrea Dworkin, a skincare feud with Hiram Yarbo, Camille Paglia, I don't know how to say half these names, Walt Disney, Aristotle, Pikachu, and why we are so unhappy and why we hate each other. Fellow shade spillers and tea throwers, this video is called Envy by Natalie Wynn. Contrapoints and There's a lot to unpack here. Thanks, Theodo. You know, most video essayists seem to always be drinking something, so I figured I'd get my drug of choice in here. My goal today is to analyze the video Envy and share my perspective on what the video means, because when I finished watching it, it took me about two or three days, and a couple of rewatches to process. It's a very nuanced video, and as we all know, the internet and nuance go together like Ben Shapiro and Cardi B. In other words, not at all. <laughs> Quick sidebar, if you are my mom, my grandma, or my cousins, please don't watch Envy. It'll make Thanksgiving awkward. <laughs> the video has a lot of fantastic ideas that I'm going to discuss, but it also has a lot of jokes that would make me, well, cringe if you heard them. Hey, how are you? Cringe. Double sidebar. Sky's rules for YouTube. If you know me in real life, no you don't. <laughs> don't bring up my videos in front of me. I will probably start spontaneously dying. Also, please pretend not to notice that I'm going by a pin name. Okay. Mmm. Dunkin' Donuts. <laughs> I forgot what I was gonna say. <laughs> it's a good day. Hmm. America runs on outrage. In real life, there are so many nuances to be explored. Online, ideas can be summed up in 240 characters or less. Society is tied into a neat little package. Every story has to have a clear villain and a clear hero. Sometimes, you get to be the hero, or at least the sidekick, if only for like five minutes. Sometimes, you get to be the villain. True social change is eschewed. Eschewed? Eschew. I don't care. <laughs> In favor of an Instagram story littered with depressing statistics. All your friends will share it at the exact same time. You will be unable to escape it. You will turn off your phone, cry alone in the bathroom, and then feel guilty that you didn't share it to your story. Children in Serbia are dying because of you, because you didn't share it to your private Instagram story where about seven people will see it. Or whatever the day's hot button issue is about before everybody forgets about it and moves on to the next tragedy. There's no time for genuine heartbreak. 
genuine compassion. Only enough time to say, Mom, man, that's sad. And then swipe right past it. Real life is filled with passion, compassion, heartbreak, awe, sorrow, empathy, anger, malaise, happiness. Real life is nuance. Real life is messy. Real life cannot be summed up in 240 characters. <laughs> Natalie Wynn understands this. That's why I like her work, and that's why it's challenging to deal with at times. That's why I think each video she posts causes such controversy, merely because the internet is not yet capable of handling such complexity and honesty without spontaneously dying. Natalie's videos deal with human nature in its raw form. Not good, not bad, just what it is. Cringe. It's tough to grapple with Natalie Wynn's videos. They never have a clear winner and a clear loser. Even if she is no longer using the Socratic dialogue format that she used to, those roots have never truly left her. The story the videos tell never have the cartoon, horrible villain we've become accustomed to dealing with online. Villains are instead real human beings with real motivation behind the things they do. My primary example of this would be the JK Rowling video, which is fantastic and is fantastic in means of condemning JK Rowling's actions without condemning her completely as a person and trying to understand where she's coming from, rather than just painting her as the evil monster from hell, which none of us are, you know? We can't ride our moral high horse and enjoy the view. We can't even enjoy some light-hearted cringe without having to analyze our inner motivations for it. There are two, four, or twenty sides to every story. That's not a story you can sum up in a tweet, no matter how hard you try. Each video is very challenging to something within the depths of human nature. Like cringe, shame, envy. Grappling with those dark issues inside of us is hard. It leaves the mind a boggled. I like that Natalie refuses to cave into the pressure to relentlessly attack those she disagrees with. She attempts to understand them, to empathize with them. She realizes that you can empathize with someone without agreeing with every word they say. What a concept. Apparently, some folks' natural reaction to that is to call her a secret CIA operative. So basically, online, any viewpoint that presents the world as anything in shades of gray is maligned as evil or a threat. The trouble is, the world isn't really black or white. It's not even gray. The world's got color, baby. That's what this channel is really about. One biological female's quest to create a harmonious color story. The world is complicated, and envy is complicated. So, I present to you my scholarly analysis of envy by ContraPoints. And by scholarly, I do mean a scholar of very long video essays. <laughs> Okay, I gotta go finish writing this video. I'll be back. You know what? I didn't pay for this. <laughs> this Team Natalie pin to not wear it in a video about ContraPoints now. Why would I do that? Okay, let's see if this works. It means I have no motor skills. Sick.
Oh, now my hair covers it. Well, at least you know it's there. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to summarize or analyze is Natalie's definition of what the concept of envy means. Envy essentially means despising someone for having what you don't have. She claims that repressed envy can turn into bitterness, resentment, rage, or even violence. Natalie posits that America as a culture has forgotten or repressed the power of envy. Flaunting an enviable lifestyle. This is a particularly American thing. Most Americans have no concept of the fear of envy. As if it's a good thing to be envied. Oh, but it is not. If people envy you, they gossip about you, right? They seethe over your successes and celebrate your misfortunes. Being envied is basically the opposite of being loved. In many other cultures, this power of envy is recognized and acknowledged and feared. Envy is a universal across all human societies, including very egalitarian ones. For example, in tribal and village cultures around the world, there's often a concept of black magic or witchcraft, which are thought to be used by envious people to bewitch the ones they envy. Hence the evil eye. The evil eye in many cultures is seen as a curse that the envious places on the envied. You're probably familiar with the concept of the evil eye, which originates in ancient Greece or maybe even earlier than that. Cultures all over the world today understand the evil eye as a kind of curse cast by the malignant gaze of an envious person. And the famous Nazar symbol is seen as protection from it. She used the Nazar symbol as a visual motif However, in America, being envied is seen as a good thing. You want to be envied. You want others to want what you've got. So we see being envied as a somewhat positive thing in America. Everyone wants that enviable lifestyle. And we see envying others as somewhat normal, like it's become normalized. Because, you know, the ultra extra 100% beef American brand of Shoot for the Stars capitalism has got us all in competition with each other. It's normal to envy what others have, right? I totally forgot to mention something. I grew up in the gifted program, and I was always pretty academically accomplished. But in middle school, as like things got more socially complicated, I tried to disguise all my achievements. And I was a pretty high achiever in middle school, and I accomplished a lot of things, but I was so embarrassed about it. I felt no pride in my own achievement. Just shame. At points, being smart made me a social outcast. So I disguised my intelligence so I could fit in. Before I watched Envy, I had had no idea how often thoughts of envy seeped into my everyday life, how often I felt jealous or envious of others, how resentment had poisoned my outlook on the world. I didn't even realize it was happening. And there's a pretty good reason for that. Natalie explained that often when we repress our envy, we turn it into morals. So like, for example, the not like other girls meme. If you are envious, like I have been in my life, of other girls who seem to have it together, girls who are popular, girls who are cool, who, you know, know how to function socially, like I don't, and you're jealous of them, which I have been, so, you know, um, it can turn into envy what you repress, and in order to have a justification for that envy, you turn it into morals. You want to repress and deny your envy, so you'll find a way instead to feel superior to those you envy. For example, I can't get a relationship turns to I'm better than the girls who only care about relationships. They'll often target promiscuous women because, in part, they have something that others want. So in order to justify their envy, which is a dark emotion that we don't want to believe we can feel, we turn it into morals. We say, oh, actually, I'm better than them. I'm better than girls who have boyfriends because it's... Sorry, I got kind of rambly here. I did, in fact, go off script in case you can't tell. I definitely had that phase, and I, in retrospect, it's kind of rough to think about. Like when I was eight years old, 
girls in my class were starting to date and I felt so far above them. I was like, oh yes, I wouldn't date a boy. I'm better than that. I'm better than those girls, those shallow girls who don't care about stuff like reading books. I care about reading books. I don't care about boys. And that embarrassing mentality persisted for a embarrassingly long time. And upon thinking about it, it's partially out of envy, out of my loneliness that I didn't feel attractive enough or good enough to have a relationship with somebody. I turned the envy into morals that upon thinking about it were not really morals at all. Oh, and of course I claimed to be a feminist. I claimed I was a feminist for looking down on girls who wore makeup, who were interested in relationships, which upon further reflection and maturity is the exact opposite of feminism. You can reframe feelings of envious inferiority is by transforming them into moral superiority. We don't have to feel guilty or ashamed of envy if we convince ourselves that what we're actually experiencing is justified, legitimate hatred. So for example, think of the morality around sexuality. The discussion of envy within feminism was also really interesting to me because this does tend to happen. This kind of stuff happens where women are said to be selling their souls to the patriarchy when they have relationships with men. In some ways, that type of thinking, that type of attitude can be rooted in envy. The slut shaming is also done pretty viciously by women to each other. And that's a complicated thing. It's more than just envy. There's also sometimes a resentment that a woman who's showing skin is using her body to get unearned attention. And that smells like envy to me. I don't use my body to get attention, so no one should. The repressed feeling is, maybe I'm a little jealous that she is getting all this attention by posting thirst traps. Not that feminine, feminine, <laughs> not that feminism is bad. I am a feminist. Um, just no longer the type of feminist that believes you can't be a feminist and be in a relationship with a man or that you can't be a feminist and have healthy social relationships with men or that you can't be a feminist and also look out for men's well-being. When I watched um, Cringe by ContraPoints, I realized how much cringing or deriving entertainment value from others' pain I had been doing. It had permeated my life without me even noticing it. All my entertainment was at someone else's expense. In the same way, when I watched Envy, I realized how much deep-seated Envy had also saturated my thinking without me even noticing it. Ugh. I'm envious of people whose dogs aren't barking right now while they're trying to film a YouTube video. So anyways, when I watched Cringe, I realized I had to work on rewiring my thinking. I had to stop deriving entertainment from other people's pain. It just didn't sit right with me. In the same way, when I watched Envy, I realized I needed to rewire my entire mindset. Envy is pain at the good fortune of others, much like cringe is good fortune at others' pain. They are like two sides to the same coin. Now, some people have used this entire argument and illustration of Envy that Natalie posed to claim that she's just a rich person trying to make us feel more sympathy for rich people. However, I really do not think that was Natalie's intention with this video. I don't think she's gone full Jordan Peterson or anything like I've seen people saying. I just think she's trying to add more nuance to the conversation. Upon first skimming of the video, it does kind of seem like that. I was bothered by it at first too, but upon rewatching, thinking, pondering, and really considering every line, I realized that she's not defending the rich. It's okay to be angry that so many people in our country are billionaires, 166, while others are dying for lack of insulin. She never says that's not a thing she should be, we should be angry about. In fact, she says the exact opposite. Saying, as some conservatives do, that all leftist or all egalitarian politics is born of envy. No. This is a specific subtype. There are plenty of reasons, other than envy or fear of envy, to oppose an economic distribution where some people have billions of dollars while other people are dying because they can't afford insulin. Objectively, 
that is not an efficient use of resources to promote human well-being. And personally, I just don't want to live in a country where people are dying because they can't afford medicine. And I'm willing to pay however many taxes it takes for that not to happen. She's saying that our motivations for ending wealth inequality, a noble goal, should not be because we are envious of the rich, but rather that we genuinely care for the poor. It's positive motivation, motivation to uplift humanity, rather than motivation to cause someone harm. I think that coming at politics with the goal to uplift the poor and help the poor, rather than just to tear down the rich, would be a better way of putting it. Not that it doesn't make me extremely angry that we have billionaires that could end world hunger and choose not to. Of course that makes me angry, but I don't want them to die. <laughs> Has it even occurred to some of you that you can be left-wing without being a communist? Like, people are mad that apparently Natalie has revealed in this video that she's not a communist. She has never been a communist. She wants to redistribute the champagne. Release from the general anguish of human existence is not a political goal. There's been many revolutions in the last few centuries. And so far, zero utopias. Envy, and hunger for that matter, are not satiated by the downfall of the old regime. And here's where things get a little bit messy. This is a segment of the video that took me a little more brain processing power to figure out. Natalie presents the idea that some of our ideas of equality are born out of envy. If I can't have it, nobody can. That sometimes when people fight for equality, they are rather fighting to bring everyone down to the same base level rather than raise everyone up to a level of thriving rather than surviving. <laughs> However, she clarifies that this is not always the case. Although sometimes that is true, a lot of the time our inclination to fight for equality is born out of actual care for other human beings. Like, I think Freud is definitely onto something here, but don't some of our community feelings also come from a place of genuine care for other people? I think the takeaway from that is it's just to be aware. Is what you're doing rooted in envy or is it rooted in empathy? Other people were up in arms about her defending Marie Antoinette. The years leading up to and during the French Revolution, Marie Antoinette was constantly defamed in these sleazy tabloids called libelle. This is the same root as the English word libel. The often pornographic libelle depicted the queen as a bisexual demon who was constantly having drunken orgies and sexually manipulating everyone around her. All of which is very interesting, but none of which is true. This woman took the blame the moral blame for the structural failings of a broken economic system. And you know what? I'm actually not that angry about that because let's be honest, guys. The French Revolution was not Marie Antoinette's fault. As Natalie said, she as an individual shouldered the burden for the failings of a system. That's really all I have to say about that. So I don't think Natalie attempting to empathize with Marie Antoinette is a crime. <laughs> people are people, you know? People are people, good and bad at the same time. Good and bad at the same time. Okay, so some of you, if you've seen the video, you may be familiar with the um, cat girl Nietzsche part. That part was a little bit more tough of a pill to swallow, but I don't think she was agreeing with everything Nietzsche was saying. I, I did disagree with some of her ideas that came out of that, but a lot of that does stem from me being a progressive Christian. But I'm going to read my notes. Yeah, I took notes from the um, Nietzsche section so that I can show you guys how I made sense of it because that is a really tough and complicated section. And... It did take me a couple of days to figure it out. Um, basically, I think the like core of that section is what people need right now is not politics, it's not extremism, it's not more radicalization, it is purpose, a meaning, a reason to live. We need leaders who are capable of questioning the legitimacy of their own authority. I think that's a direct quote. We need leaders who are willing to fight for real love, real justice, real truth. Well, like him. <coughs> but also like Martin Luther King Jr. 
uh, Martin Luther King Jr., who responded to Nietzsche by saying, Yes, love without power is anemic, but power without love is... I'll just show the quote. <laughs> Unfortunately, most of the people who are who are willing to fight for love, for justice, and for truth are also unwilling to fight for power. What we need is good people who are willing to fight for power. There was a New York Times article about young women's attitudes toward political ambition, and one of the women who was interviewed said, As a white woman, I know I have unearned privilege. So am I really the best person to be in leadership? Uh, yes. Yes, you are, because we need leaders like you who are capable of questioning the legitimacy of their own authority. If you think power is evil, then you've given up on the ambition to acquire any power, which virtually guarantees your political irrelevance, since, like MLK said, you have to at least have some power to implement the demands of justice. Most of the people who could be strong leaders, who could be leaders who bring true justice to our communities instead are fall into the trap of such humility that they forget that they are capable of being leaders they are unwilling to fight for power which means that only the corrupt are willing to fight for power so basically the reason that we have so many corrupt leaders is because the good people don't see themselves as being worthy of this power it's it's a criticism of an ideology of resentment an ideology that we should hate ourselves and feel guilty about everything and not consider ourselves worthy of having any power. If you are a person of integrity, a person who is willing to fight for love, you should consider yourself worthy of power. We need people like you to be in power, to fight the systems of corruption that have taken over this country. And social media is an incubator of resentment and this envy, this resentment, this constant bitterness pushes people towards radicalization. It is dangerously easy. She mentions the, what I saw a commenter call the leftist black pill. Um, if you're not familiar, a black pill is basically an incel term. I don't want to explain incels. Incels are people who think they'll never, mostly men who think they'll never be able to get with a woman. It's pretty hopeless. It's a pretty miserable worldview. The leftist black pill is the refusal to accept anything that could change, accept that anything could change, preferring to wallow in endless misery and rage, anger at the system rather than accepting the fact that, ooh, maybe there is hope, maybe we could change things. Um, that confronted things for me. I wrote in my notes, do I want change for change's sake, pure, or do I just enjoy feeling angry and heartbroken and justified in it because it makes me feel moral and righteous? Oh, I think I understand the video. <laughs> Because I had been trying to understand the video for a while at that point, and all of a sudden I realized that the point of it is to confront your own desire. Have I been fighting for justice because I care about justice, or have I been fighting for justice because it makes me feel morally superior to everyone else? That is a tough pill to take. I said, I like to wallow in my own bitterness. Why is it so fun to do that? Whoa, head spinning, perspective changing. This is what active listening does. It changes a man. Blaming society instead of trying to fix your life. At a certain point, you can't be an accomplice in your own annihilation. Society is bad and wants you dead. Okay, are you gonna help it along? Are you gonna believe what it is saying to you? Or are you gonna fight society? In other words, comrades, losers, and haters, don't take the leftist black pill. Be the one who believes in justice. To be the one who believes in love and is willing to fight for power. Be that person. <laughs> Natalie mentioned that something like the Christian idea of love may be a factor that the left needs. And funnily enough, I actually got recommended an article from The Atlantic today called Does the Left Need Jesus? Which is kind of a funny title, but it's a really interesting read. Okay, it's actually called Cornell West on Why the Left Needs Jesus, which he never actually said in the article, so... You know, clickbaity headlines. I'm not here to convert you or anything like that. I'm just here to provide a perspective on how we can find the strength to love. Time to read.
My hunch is that those... Okay, these days, most of the real, real fire in the Democratic Socialists of America is the younger generation. My hunch is that those younger brothers and sisters and comrades are deeply spiritual, but many of them have distanced themselves from the churches and the mosques and the synagogues. Because they failed. Mainstream Christianity is a colossal failure in terms of standing up for poor people. You get black churches concerned about prisons, but for the most part, mainstream Christianity has been concerned with what American culture has been concerned with, which is success. Becoming enviable, it doesn't say that, but you know. And success has never been the same as spiritual greatness. But I think the left can teach Christians like myself very much in terms of their willingness to speak in a courageous way to the least of these, to echo the 25th chapter of Matthew. The poor, the orphan, the widow, the exploited. They've done a much better job than most churches, synagogues, temples, and mosques. The marketization of Christianity and Judaism and Buddhism and Islam is something to be resisted in the name of the prophetic element of those religions. But the prophetic dimension is weak. It's pushed to the fringes, and so you end up with the prophetic elements, those willing to fight for justice and love, aligning themselves instead with deeply secular forces. <laughs>
Um, and his comment made me happy. Everyone, remember, love your brothers, your sisters, and your siblings with all your heart. Peace and love. <laughs>